You're never 100% safe when you're aboard a ship out on the water. Even if your vessel was made by master craftspeople, there's a lot that can go wrong when you're miles from the land and at the mercy of the waves and the tide. The overwhelming majority of journeys undertaken by ships are incident-free. But every so often one goes wrong and ends up on the news. And it's the most amazing of those newsworthy stories that we're looking at in this video. These days, the wreck of the MS Zenobia is a popular diving site off the shore of Larnaca in Cyprus. Finding out how to take a guided tour of the wreck is easy. Finding out what happened to turn it into a wreck in the first place is a little more difficult. The brand new ferry was fresh out of the dock on its maiden voyage in May 1980 when it ran into trouble. It was carrying a shipment of tractor trailers from Sweden to Syria when it began to list heavily to the port side as it approached Greece. The captain thought that too much water had been pumped into the ballast tanks, and so he ordered them to be drained as the ship docked in Cyprus. That didn't solve the problem. As it attempted to resume its journey, the issue reoccurred, and this time it was much worse. It had barely made it a mile out of port before it had to be abandoned, and as the rescue boats left, it was already on its way to the bottom of the ocean. Conspiracy theories surround the fate of the ship. Despite there being allegedly $200 million worth of cargo on board, no insurance claim was ever made. Some people believe that instead of carrying trailers, it was actually carrying illegal weapons. The Italian cruiser San Giorgio is an unusual ship. It sunk not once, but twice. The armored vessel was built in 1910 and was part of the Italian war fleet during the First World War and was called upon to repeat her wartime duties after the outbreak of the Second World War. By that time, she had a modern anti-aircraft suite on board, and she was sent to bolster the defenses of the Syrian port city of Tobruk in 1941. She didn't perform very well in that role. Allied forces closed in on the port, and the captain ordered the ship to be scuttled to avoid capture. That didn't stop the British from finding her, and they used her as an immobile repair ship from 1943 until 1945. Having taken a liking to her, the Brits ordered her to be salvaged after the war ended, and the operation was successfully completed in 1952. Unbelievably, as she was being towed back to Italy, she broke free of her tow line and sank for a second time. This time, there was no way back for the San Giorgio, and it's still beneath the waves today. The story of the Turkish ocean freighter MV Kizmetim 1 changes depending on who you ask about it. Her crew insists that she was a simple cargo ship that sank in a heavy storm. The Turkish Navy, backed by American officials, insist that she was being used to ship an illegal cargo of narcotics across the Mediterranean, and that the crew sank her on purpose to prevent the authorities from confirming what was in her hold. Allegedly, that shipment was over 3,000 kilograms of morphine and it was on its way to drug lords in Turkey. The vessel had already been caught once shipping heroin in 1991, and it had been under heavy surveillance ever since. On December 15, 1992, the Kizmetim passed through the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean Sea, where it was confronted by three Turkish Navy warships, a Turkish submarine, and the American destroyer USS Briscoe. Instead of surrendering, the crew tried to flee to Cyprus with the other vessels in hot pursuit. Four days later, she sank in rough seas, with the crew being rescued but the cargo being lost. That made proving criminal guilt impossible, but the whole incident is still considered to be highly suspicious. The sinking of the Costa Concordia is one of the most notorious maritime incidents of recent times, and yet it would never have happened at all was it not for the arrogance and incompetence of Italian captain Francesco Cettino? The cruise ship hit a reef close to the island of Giglio in January 2012, while Cettino was attempting to show off to both his passengers and the people on the coastline. His recklessness resulted in the boat capsizing, a crime that he's currently in prison for, and will likely remain there for at least the next 10 years, to compound his error. He also attempted to abandon the ship without attempting to ensure the safety or rescue of the thousands of people aboard the vessel at the time of the incident. For a long time after the incident, the ship remained in the water, tipped onto its side. 
but it was eventually righted in July 2014 and dragged to Genoa, there to be broken apart for scrap. It later transpired that Chiteno had ordered the ship to be sailed close to the coastline as a salute to the people watching from the shore, and had failed to take into account the presence of sharp rocks in the vicinity. Accidents and sinkings don't come much more dramatic than the MT Haven. The enormous crude oil carrier was laden with one million barrels of oil when it caught fire off the coast of Genoa on April 11, 1991. The fire quickly reached the cargo hold and the ship exploded. The force of the explosion was so violent that the ship was torn in two, and the fire continued to burn for three days even as the wreck began to sink. 50,000 tons of crude oil leaked into the Mediterranean, and the effects of the pollution were still being felt on the coast of both Italy and France for a full 12 years after the incident. Nobody knows for sure why the fire started. The cargo was being unloaded onto a floating platform when, according to testimony from the crew, there was a very loud crunching noise, quickly followed by a large-scale fire. It's been speculated that the cover of one of the pumps broke, but the damage caused by the fire was so bad that it was impossible to confirm this during the subsequent investigation. At the start of March 1964, an 80-gun British Royal Navy ship of the line went down during a severe storm close to the coast of Gibraltar. The ship was the HMS Sussex, and the sinking was the start of a treasure hunt that's still ongoing today. Legend has it that the vessel was carrying 10 tons of gold coins at the time of its sinking, and the currency would have a modern-day value of over $500 million. National governments and private research companies spent centuries looking for the wreck, culminating in the discovery of the ship in 2001, a hole 2,500 feet below sea level. It was the American company Odyssey Marine Exploration that found the wreck, and they agreed on a deal with the British government to split the value of all the treasure on board. Before they could start trying to salvage the gold, the Spanish government intervened and claimed that the ship was in their waters, so they had a claim on it, and also posited a theory that it may not be the Sussex after all. That debate is still going on now all these years later, and the treasure is still considered lost. Our next story concerns not only one shipwreck, but a whole series of them. The Hawaiian island of Lanai has a six-mile-long stretch of shore known as Shipwreck Beach that has become the home of no less than a dozen shipwrecks, most notably the enormous hulk of the YOGN-42, a ferro-cement fuel barge used by the U.S. Navy, joined by the Navy Yard oiler YO-21. The area is known for its high winds and strong currents, but not all of the shipwrecks arrived through misfortune. During the 19th century, it became a dumping ground for steamship companies looking to offload their old, unwanted vessels. They'd release them into the tide and allow them to beach themselves. And then they would claim the whole thing was an accident. The YOGN-42 and the YO-21 were both made from concrete, which explains why they've held together so well for so many years but the rotting carcasses of several timber ships are still clearly visible as you walk along the beach, accompanied by anchors, engines, and boilers that are now coated with thick layers of algae and coral. It's quite a scenic walk. The USS Buchanan is a shipwreck now, but it took a lot of effort to turn her into one. The Charles F. Adams class guided missile destroyer was commissioned in 1960 and remained in service with the United States Navy from then until 1991. That included serving in the Vietnam War, followed by 10 years serving in the East Pacific and another 10 working closer to home off the coast of California. In 1985, though, she found herself the focus of a dispute with New Zealand, which refused to let her dock on account of the fact that the ship had nuclear armaments, and the government of New Zealand at the time was vehemently opposed to them. After decommissioning in 1991, she was allocated to be sunk as a target. Despite her age, she didn't go down easily. By the time she eventually went down on June 14th in the year 2000, she'd been hit by a trio of AGM-114 Hellfire air-to-surface missiles, a further three Harpoon anti-ship missiles, and a 2,400-pound laser-guided bomb. 
none of that finished the job and so the Navy eventually had to place 200 pounds of explosives aboard her and remotely detonate them, finally ending her service. If you were a fan of the British television comedy series Father Ted, you'll have seen the MV Plassey before. It's the shipwreck seen on the beach in the show's opening credits. Beaching on the rocks of Inishir, Ireland in 1960 is how it ended its story, but the tale began in 1940 in England, where the Shakespearean-class naval trawler launched from the coast of Yorkshire under the name HMS Juliet and entered service as a minesweeper during the Second World War. When the war ended, the ship was sold to the Limerick Steamship Company and officially renamed MV Plassey. She spent 20 years carrying out cargo duties around the coast of Ireland, but was driven onto the beach during a storm. At the time, she was carrying a cargo of stained glass, yarn, and whiskey Unsurprisingly, the whiskey made her a popular target for looting, and so after the Irish locals had successfully rescued the crew, they quickly returned to the vessel and made off with all the alcohol before the authorities could seize it. There's nothing of value left on the old wreck today, and despite the fact that it's structurally unsound, it's still occasionally used by children as a makeshift climbing frame. The sinking of any vessel carrying cargo and crew is a cause for concern. The sinking of a vessel that's laden heavy with dangerous chemicals is a potential catastrophe. That's why a lot of people were worried about the Lavoli Sun when it went down in the English Channel in October 2000. The Italian tanker was carrying more than 6,000 tons of toxic chemicals at the time of its accident, including styrene, methyl ethyl ketone, and isopropyl alcohol. The English Channel is a tiny body of water, covering only a few short miles between the south coast of England and the north coast of France. But there's still enough open water there for bad weather to cause issues, and the heavy seas that October day were too much for the Lavoli Sun to handle. It's thought that water intake at the bow contributed to the problem, flooding the bow thruster bay and causing a negative pitch from which the vessel was unable to recover. A small oil slick on the sea close to the vessel briefly prompted fear of an enormous ecological disaster, but ultimately no further leakage appeared. The crew of the tanker was rescued, but although a tugboat briefly seemed to have secured a lock on the ship, it broke free and sank the morning after the incident. The gigantic Panamax bulk carrier MV Drake is still afloat today, and because her name has been changed, Few of the people who see her know that she was involved in a notorious beaching incident in 2007. Back then, she was known as the Pasha Bulker. Her famous accident happened on June 8th of that year, while she was waiting in the sea off Nobby's Beach in New South Wales, Australia, preparing to load coal. The crew had been warned about an approaching storm, but the captain chose to ignore it. Embarrassingly, the ship never radioed for help, never attempted to deploy an anchor, and had a fully operational engine when it was beached. The crew, including the seemingly incompetent captain, were rescued, but the ship was stuck fast between the beach and a rocky reef. While she was trapped there, the protest group Greenpeace used her as an advertising billboard, spray-painting anti-coal slogans onto the side of the stricken vessel. It wasn't until July 2nd that the carrier was finally refloated after two failed rescue attempts. From there, it took a year to fully repair her, and she was relaunched as the Drake in mid-2008. Whales, as most people know and appreciate, are enormous creatures. They're large, they're powerful, and they're surprisingly fast. That's why anyone with common sense wouldn't need to be told that deliberately irritating one of them is a very bad idea. Not everyone has common sense, though. And that's why a 40-ton whale jumped out of the water to attack a yacht in 2010. The couple on the yacht, 59-year-old Ralph Moths and his partner Paloma Werner, claimed they were innocently trying to take pictures of the creature. But people on the shoreline of Cape Town, South Africa, claimed that the yacht repeatedly drove at the whale at high speed, provoking it. When it jumped and crashed down on the yacht, it destroyed the mast and caused other cosmetic damage before slinking back below the waves. 
Local law in Cape Town says that boats are supposed to stay 1,000 feet away from whales and steer away from them when they're sighted. So aside from having an expensive repair bill, the couple faced the risk of prosecution for their actions. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!